you can still. Yes, also, sorry, we are recording this session um, because um, we want to have it available to you afterwards if you want. Um, there will be some breakout rooms, which um, Zoom can't record, um, but uh, the main part of the session will be recorded. Also, the slides are on that same link if you want to download them and follow along or you just want them for reference. Um, and if you don't feel like putting on your camera or coming off mute because you don't want to be a part of the recording, that's totally fine. You can always put thoughts, questions, and comments in the chat, um, and we'll be happy to be monitoring that. So welcome. Thank you for being patient as we got it started. Um, this session is called Build Data Roots to Reach New Heights in Your Work, Rethinking the Intake Process. Hopefully you're in the right place. Um, my name is M. Carr. I use they, them pronouns. I am a project manager at the Capacity Collective. And um, I'm going to be talking to you about data today, uh, which is something I love. Um, so the Capacity Collective provides data capacity building support to small community-based nonprofits, um, including many BSK-funded nonprofits through uh, BSK Technical Assistance. Um, our Director of Operations, Meredith Williams, is also here today. Um, I think there's also a few other people from our organization in the audience. Um, I'm going to let Meredith introduce herself in a moment. Uh, before I was at the Capacity Collective, I worked in the nonprofit world for a long time. Um, I was a direct service provider, a home visitor, a case manager. I was also a program coordinator. Um, I know how frustrating it is to feel like data is getting in the way of doing your of you doing your work instead of helping you. Um, so I'm hoping that we can use this session to start the conversation about a data process that is pretty universal and is often a pain point for organizations and clients. Um, I'll pass it over to Meredith to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I am so happy to see so many familiar names and welcome to everyone. I, so I'm Meredith Williams, the Director of Operations and one of the co-founders of the Capacity Collective. Prior to starting the Capacity Collective, I was a professor of sociology and criminology and being in academia was great for learning all of these tools and how to understand social issues, how to actually create systemic change. So we created the Capacity Collective to do that work and not just talk about it in journals. And so we are so happy to be here today and hopefully planting some seeds of rethinking the way that you look at data. So I wish we had time for everyone in the audience to um introduce themselves in the larger group, but I wanna make sure that we get to all of our material and also hopefully have some time for questions at the end. So um, we're gonna do introductions in breakout rooms. And instead of doing introductions here, um, I'm gonna launch a quick poll. And if people could answer these quick questions, that would be great. In the meantime, as you answer that, I will quickly go over our agenda. So um, we are going to um, hear your thoughts on the intake forms you just completed. We're going to cover some best practices when it comes to intake forms and the intake process. Then we're going to workshop the intake process together. Um, we'll share out and reflect on that workshopping process, um, share some final thoughts, and then hopefully have time at the end for questions. Um, if we don't get to one of your questions or you think of something later, uh, I am going to share both Meredith's email and mine, and you are always welcome to get in touch with us. Um, we love talking about data. So it looks like people are answering the poll. We've got 14 out of 24 people who've responded. I think we can get a better response rate than that. It did jump to 62 when you said that, so good job. <laughs> Okay, I am going to share the results from this. Hopefully people had a chance to answer. Um, it looks like we have a pretty even spread of different positions, um, which is really fun and interesting. I'm very excited to hear different perspectives on this process. Um, also very interested in the other. Uh, and it looks like we also have a pretty even split of people who do conduct client intakes and people who don't. Um, I'm very excited to hear from the people who do conduct 
uh, client intakes in their day-to-day -day work. And I hope that you all feel comfortable speaking up and sharing your feedback and experiences because um, often forms are designed by people who aren't filling them out. And sometimes that's not the best. So um, if you do conduct intakes regularly, like please share during this uh, session. Okay. Um, next, I would like us to go into some breakout rooms. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that we can do introductions in there. Um, I'd like you all to um, start talking about how filling out the form, the intake form that you filled out at the beginning felt to you. If it's a form that you'd want to use as an agency, why or why not? And if it's a form that you would like to complete as a client, and why or why not? Um, we have a Jamboard um, that we're going to use to uh, share some of our thoughts about this. I am going to quickly show you how to use Jamboard if you've never used it before. So Meredith just dropped a link in the chat. It leads to a, um, it leads to a, like a Google app. That's what Jamboard is. And you'll see this kind of whiteboard. Um, only one person from each group needs to be writing things down. So if you're on the move, that's okay. As long as someone else can write things down. Um, and if you want to add a comment, you can click on the sticky note over on the left-hand menu and type things and then press save. And it will automatically go onto the page and you can drag it to wherever you want. So you can go ahead and start doing that in your breakout rooms, which I will now open. Okay. So please head into the room that um, corresponds with uh, the form that you filled out. And we're gonna take about five minutes in there. Then we'll come back and we will share out together. How do we get to the breakout rooms? I saw a quick thing pop up and then it disappeared. Oh, um, let me broadcast. Are other people having um, trouble joining the breakout rooms? Oh, yes. here, it's under more. I see. There's three dots for more. And uh, thank you. I see the comment about the... Um, Jamboard and I'm changing the permissions right now. So um, anyone should be able to edit it now. If you reload the page, hopefully it'll work. Okay, I will see you all in a few minutes. It doesn't come up uh, the prompt to join in on my screen. Okay, um, I can also manually assign you to a room. Um, which form did you fill out? Uh, I think I filled the questionnaire. Which one? The, the role survey. Okay, let me move you. Does anyone else need to be manually assigned to a breakout room? Yeah, like I joined in late. I was in the previous meeting that's at eleven fifteen, so I didn't fill any forms. Okay, that's okay. Um, I will just assign you to a group and feel free to like introduce yourself and share some thoughts. Okay, thank you. Okay, everyone else who's here, I'm gonna start just putting you in rooms. <laughs>
Hi, welcome. We're currently in breakout rooms, so I'm going to move you to a breakout room. Georgie, I'm going to pop into a few of the rooms and check on folks. Great. So and you could put me in a room too, if you'd like. Oh, okay, cool. I'm going to put you in the smallest room. They need to be okay. And out. That looks good. And Yolanda is a program manager from Best Arts. It looks like I'm just going to admit her. If, well, or you could admit her. She's just joining. All right. Thanks. Bye. Hi, Chloe. Hi, Yolanda. Welcome. We are um, in breakout rooms discussing various intake forms. Uh, so if you would like to join a breakout room, I can assign you to them. People are introducing themselves and talking about forms that they filled out um, at this link. Uh, I can just wait. Okay. All right, I'm going to go pop into some of the other rooms. Uh, yes, I can put you in a breakout room. Okay.
Hi, welcome, Amanda. Um, we are just okay. Looks like we're getting some good feedback on our forms. Welcome, Al. We are in breakout rooms right now. So we're gonna be coming together in one minute. All right, welcome back, folks. Welcome back, everyone. So sorry to cut any conversations short, but we are going to have two more breakout rooms in the session. We're going to have plenty of time to talk. Um, and like I said, if you are interested in viewing um, my opinions on the forms, that these sample forms, uh, there are annotated versions um, at the same link that you completed the format, um, which is also in the chat. And um, the annot annotations, you know, not saying that they caught everything, but they're just pointing out some, you know, different perspectives on each of the forms. So uh, it looks like we have some great feedback here. I know that this is a little bit small on my screen, but um, I'm going to just keep this up while we share out. Um, does anyone want to talk about how filling out these forms felt or share any of the feedback that you discussed in your group? Feel free to just Come off mute and share. Okay. 
maybe let's start with form one. Um, I am seeing, how did filling, filling out the form feel to you? Like I was completing the form wrong, panicky, uh, irritated by the questions, questions felt invasive, demographics didn't capture many diverse identities. Yeah, does anyone wanna elaborate on any of those points? For those of you who didn't fill out this form, it was a Word document that you had to download and then type in. There were lots of good comments in the first group that filled out the first form about just the feelings of anxiety and stress and invasion, even from downloading a Word doc where there's checkboxes, but you can't actually check the checkboxes or there's lines. But if you try to type it, it, it messes up the line. And so um, the, the feelings of frustration about that. But also one good thing about it was that you could see how long the intake form was. So you didn't feel trapped in an electronic form where it could be 17 pages and you have no idea. So it's nice that you were able to anchor yourself and know how far you were in the form and how much was left. Yeah, and to be clear, I did not like design these forms to make like one of them good, one of them medium, one of them bad. Like they all have good components to them and then they all have components that might be challenging or you might wanna change. Um, the point about it being a physical form that you can see the end of, it looks like that came up for people in form two as well, which was a Google form, um, that it would be um, challenging on a phone, um, difficult when you're doing a mobile friendly version, um, that it was low barrier, but it maybe doesn't work with people who don't use email. I know also if you're ever doing um, intakes with people and you're like out and about, you might not have a, yeah, a phone or a tablet or internet connection to be able to do that. Does anyone want to share anything else about form two or form three? For form three, um, that one appeared to be set up as a, a, a digital form that, that kept, after I answered a question, it would go to a new one. Um, and I actually, uh, one of the very first questions was qualification and I did not qualify for the program. So process ended, which actually was great because I didn't waste my time filling out the rest of a form for something that I didn't qualify for, so. Yeah, any other feedback on either of the, of the digital forms? Okay, we're not going to be focusing so much on um, the pros and cons of like digital versus paper um, or different platforms in this session. We're gonna be talking a little more about like questions and the contents of questions, but if you ever want opinions on that, um, I'd be happy to share. <laughs> and the opinion is that there is no one size fits all. It's what's best for your organization and your community and your participants. Okay. Um, I am going to share my screen again. So thanks for your patience. So why do intake forms matter? Well, hopefully you think that they matter if you came to this session um, and were intrigued enough to show up here. Um, but in case you came here by accident, or if you have to convince someone else that they matter, here are a few talking points. Um, and you know, the few intake forms that I had you fill out, they might seem like, wow, that was so exaggeratedly bad, or that was so exaggeratedly good, or or whatever, but they're real forms based on real forms that I have seen in the world, um, real forms that I have filled out in the world. Um, so, for a lot of organizations out there, probably most of your organizations, the intake form is the form that they revisit the least. Um, or if you revisit it, often you're just adding questions. Um, intake forms tend to be really long. 
unwieldy, dated, they can be redundant, um, but they're the first impression that you're making on your clients. Um, they set the tone for the rest of your relationship with the people that you are serving. So if you've ever accessed a social service, if you ever got, have gone to a food bank or filled out a rental assistance application, um, you know that intake forms can be tedious, mind-numbing, dehumanizing. That's not a great way to set the tone for your work with someone, especially if you're doing some sort of case management or home visiting where you're really going to form a relationship with your client and their family. Um, so yes, that's the tone. Doesn't get edited a lot. Um, also, I don't think I need to tell many of you how harmful and extractive um, focusing on just funder goals for data can be. Data can be really powerful um, in a good way and in a bad way. I imagine that most of you got into this work because you care about the people that you're working with and you have really strong values, but often our data processes don't reflect those values. Um, so we have an opportunity in the intake process to heal a lot of harm that has been done to a lot of our participants um, by modeling a different way of interacting with a service provider, one where they get their agency respected, they see themselves and their identity in the options that are there, and they have the right to say no to things. Um, because collecting data in exchange for services is inherently coercive. Um, and so it can be really difficult for people to, you know, people are so in the habit, if you've accessed the social service before, of just sort of spilling out all of these really personal pieces of information to you, but it doesn't have to be that way. We can model something different. Um, so what can you do about it? Um, Maybe you have absolutely no say in the intake form that you use. That is totally fine. That is usually how it goes. You know, if it's an agency-wide intake form and you are just one program, it's really hard to change that. Um, or maybe it came before your time. Maybe you don't have time to work on your forms because you are doing very important work, which is very valid. Um, I'm not saying that you need to go back to your organization and change absolutely everything about your intake processes, but hopefully this session will give you some concrete information and some concrete next steps that you can take to take back to your organization, look at your forms, um, or advocate for change to be made. So there's a few key questions that I want everyone to keep in mind when they are designing an intake form, really any form. Um, and I promise I will explain these more in the next few slides, but um, for every piece of information that you are gathering, for every question that you're asking, you should think, why are you asking this? When are you asking this? And how are you asking this? So why are you asking? Is it, who needs to know? Is it because a funder needs to know or because you need to know? Um, sometimes it's not even a current funder, you know, we get grants and we get a new grant reporting requirement. We tack on this new question, which maybe is something that we're not collecting. Maybe it's something that we are collecting. Um, and then that grant goes away and we never take the question off and the form just gets longer and longer and longer. Um, I'll give a kind of obvious example, age and date of birth. You can calculate age from date of birth. So asking for both of them is redundant, but a lot of intake forms do that, um, which is confusing. It tires out the person filling out the form. It can also be really confusing for the person doing data entry because say the data points don't agree. Maybe someone wrote their age wrong. You know, they I forget how old I am all the time. And so then you're like, wait, which one is right? What do I report on? So think about who needs to know and if you're already collecting it. And tied into that, is this absolutely essential? So sometimes we might be asked to gather data that we don't agree with. If you can push back, do so. Um, if you can't, consider making whatever you can optional or offering a prefer not to answer option. Um, also consider, can you offer follow through? So why are you asking about this? You know, I'll give the example of disability or primary language. Um, especially if it's not required for reporting. If you're asking about, you know, the primary language that someone speaks, 
but you can't offer interpretation services, um, it might be misleading. The person might think, oh, great, I'm going to be able to get services in my language. And then that's not actually something you offer. You're just collecting that data point. So make it really clear why you're collecting things so that people know why they're providing the information. And also they don't get their hopes that uh, for a service that you don't actually provide. And it's okay to say, you know, we don't provide this at this time, but we're hoping to in the future. We need to know, you know, what the language that's most needed is. That's okay. Just be transparent and clear. Also, consider whether this could cause harm. Sometimes the questions that we ask might give us valuable or even crucial information, but they also have the potential to offend, hurt, or trigger our clients. Um, I'll give an example in the next slide. So in this case, um, when you feel like you need to ask a really sensitive question, the when and the how become really important. So when are you asking? Is this the right time to ask for this information? Have you built enough trust with your client for them to feel comfortable sharing this with you? And do you need to know this information right now to best do your job? So we have this system at a lot of nonprofits where we gather like all of this information about our clients right at the beginning of working with them. And then we gather more information along the way, but we're asking them for the bulk of the information that we need right at the beginning. It doesn't have to be that way. You know, you, you run the risk, sure, if someone skips out on services or doesn't come back or you lose touch with them, that you might have missing data points in your system. But if you consider trimming down your intake process or spacing it out over, you know, a few sessions, um, perhaps the good that it'll do is, you know, greater than any potential missing data points. And I'm not saying that you need to do that. That's just a idea to put out there because we're so used to this one model of, this really, really long form with everything that we need. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be structured that way. Um, I'll give an example that uh, is really pertinent to the when. Um, so um, intimate partner violence. One of the forms, um, I think it was form three, um, asked if uh, the person filling out the form had a, a safe home environment to host a home visit. That's an important thing for you to know if you're a home visitor, you want to know what you're walking into. You want to know if the space that you're going to be going into is safe in a lot of different ways. Um, if there is domestic violence, intimate partner violence happening, you want to know that so that you can support the person that you're working with. Um, but that might be a hard thing to ask, you know, first thing on the form, like right when you are getting to know someone. They might not feel comfortable disclosing to you. It might be off-putting. Um, and also, you know, I'll talk about this a little more later, but like the, the format of how you're asking matters. Um, so if you were filling out that form and you were like, got a little jarred when you saw that question, that's good. That's something to note because maybe it means that it was too early in the process to ask that. So also, how are you asking? Um, and Meredith made the point in the chat, if they do answer, but they don't trust you yet, you're not getting accurate information. And I'll reiterate that people are really used to answering invasive questions in order to get social services. So they might answer, you know, because they know that, that, or they think that I have to answer this in order to be able to access this service. Um, but uh, they might not be answering honestly, so you're not getting good data. And you're kind of, you know, not doing some trust building there. So I won't get too deep into the how because we have some empower tools, which are free handouts. Um, Meredith's going to share the link in the chat that talk more specifically about this. But the way that you ask questions is also really important. Um, so, you know, consider having a form that someone fills out on their own at home versus having a conversational interview. That's really different. Um, neither one is better or worse. They both have their advantages or disadvantages. Um, but they have a really different impact um, on the experience. And also, um, you know, you might want to make a client facing form, you might phrase it differently than you might an internal facing form. Um, also, uh, yeah, phrasing, which we've already sort of touched on a few times. So if filling out any of the forms um, at the beginning made you feel uncomfortable, 
um, or like some of the questions seems like offensive or made you cringe, like that's an important thing to notice um, because the phrasing is really key. And again, um, this is most important if it's a client facing form because the client is going to be looking at the form and reading it and filling it out. But also it is important to consider for internal forms too. You know, it, um, someone that I work with, um, Vanessa lovejoy Garon at Hummingbird Indigenous Family Services um, told me that her rule of thumb is that she um, never writes anything down that she wouldn't feel comfortable reading back to the client. And I thought that that was a great rule of thumb for forms too. Um, don't phrase things in a way that would be uncomfortable to read back to someone because people should have access to their data and it should be something that, you know, gives them respect. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that should also reflect your values and how you're asking. Um, yeah, so there's no right answer. There's no like one best way to phrase any given question. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do things and they depend on your organization, your program, your needs. Um, they depend on your community, how you're going to be reporting that data or what you're going to be doing with it. Um, but you should just think carefully about how you're phrasing things. Um, and so in order to do that, we recommend that you um, gather feedback at all levels. So gather feedback from people who are filling out the form clients and compensate them for their time giving you feedback. Also gather feedback from any staff that are the ones filling out the form because, you know, as I said at the beginning, it can be really frustrating to be asked to administer a form that you don't like or don't agree with. Um, and make things optional whenever you can and make sure that there's informed consent um, because it's really important that people know uh, what's happening to their data. Okay. Um, so now I have talked for enough time and we're gonna do another quick exercise. Um, I wanna share the Jamboard link in the chat again and I would like us to- I am, I'm so minutes. sorry. Do you mind, could we just see if anyone has any questions or comments at this point? We're doing well on time, yeah. so maybe we can do a check-in really quick. Absolutely. Anyone have any thoughts about what we've discussed so far? Feel free to put them in the chat too if you don't want to come off mute. Thank you, Al. Thanks, Anne. I appreciate that you um, called out that intake forms collect so much information at the beginning. And I I hadn't really thought of that, like that you just assume you always have to fill out all that information at the beginning. But um, yeah, maybe you don't. It's an interesting thought. Yeah, um, that's when the when really comes in. You know, if you think about it, all you really probably need to know to start working with someone is like, their name and how to contact them. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of the times people are informally collecting that um, before they do any intake process. If you have any sort of like referral process or an interest form, you know, you're, you're getting like the bare bones of what you need to start working with that person. And that's really like the, the first step in your data collection and the rest can come later. I also see in the chat that Julianne asked if, um, You'll be able to have access to the recording of this meeting and the answer is um, yes. Um, I assume it'll be available via Whova, but also we're going to hopefully get the list of attendees and uh, send out the recording in the slides as well. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah, yeah I, know, I love your example about like uh, the rephrasing, don't write something that you don't feel comfortable um, uh, saying out loud and then like, how you build trust with time. But like, when is the when is the, the line between, because like if you get, you gain this trust of the person and then you share so much more information and then what's the line where you don't put all that in your, your uh, collecting the data because people will share more with time. Yeah, that is such a great question. Um, and there is no right answer, you know, like it really depends on the type of data you're collecting and what you're going to be using it for. Um, we talk a lot about information versus data. So if you think about like 
data is something that you want to be able to like report on later. Um, you need to be able to like see trends in it and maybe share it out with other people like funders or a board. Information is stuff that helps you do your job better. So, you know, you might know that like maybe the person that you're working with wouldn't call the situation that they're in intimate partner violence or domestic violence, but you know that it's a fraught relationship and it's, you know, like a, a difficult for you to go into their home. Um, so maybe that's information that you know. It doesn't necessarily need to turn into data that's reported. Um, and it can be something that you gather and note over time, whether it's like in a data system or in a form, or I mean, you know, some things don't always have to be written down. It, it really depends on what you're going to be doing with it. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. I think it might also be helpful to think about who has access to the data. A lot of us are uh, stuck using data systems that the model or the funder has asked us to use. And so I would not put anything into the data system, frankly, that I thought was going to jeopardize somebody like their documentation status or something like that. And so I think just thinking about how it's going to be used. And also, I would be really transparent about that when collecting data from people. If somebody's going to have access to it, they should know that so they can decide the degree to which they feel safe sharing that with you. Absolutely. Documentation status is a great example. Um, I used to work with a lot of undocumented folks. They understandably were really reluctant to share any information with us um, and like for good reason. And so being really clear about what information we're collecting, what information we really need, like actually need to be able to do our jobs and what's optional or what could people opt out of and then where it's going to live and what's going to happen to it. Having that on deck, I mean, ideally you have like a, thing written up that outlines that, but if not being, or even if you do, being able to verbally explain it to people so that they can understand what's happening with their personal information is, is really important. Thank you, thank you. Great, so um, if there are other questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I'm hoping we can do another exercise in breakout rooms. Um, I am going to, um, it's gonna be on Jamboard. I'm gonna show you a quick example, um, but just for context, I'm hoping that we can, um, we can talk about um, pieces, potential data points um, that we might need to know. Um, so I know there's a lot of different people in the room. I'm gonna switch to Jamboard and I think that's going to make this exciting. So um, for this next exercise, I'm hoping that we can sort of do a fill in the blank situation. So I put an example here, which does not have to be the, like, I hope you discuss other examples, <laughs> but as a home visitor, I need to know the family's needs so I can refer them to appropriate resources. That's a little bit vague. I didn't want to give too good of an example because I want you all to be able to come up with some of them. <laughs> but think of things that you might need to know, like when you're doing an intake, um, when you're first working with someone. Um, yeah, or at any point in the process. I mean, it doesn't have to be a service provider. If you're a funder, maybe you need to know a program's, you know, total enrollment so you can make sure that they're meeting their enrollment goals. Um, so drop in you know, who you are, um, something or a couple things that you might need to know and why you need to know them. Um, do you scrolling just a little bit to show where you go to the next slide, if you're already in Jamboard, how you go to the next. So if you're in Jamboard, if you've loaded the Jamboard and it came up with this first page, up at the top, there's a one out of four and you can click the next arrow. It will bring you to this next page, page two. And um, again, you can click the sticky note on the left. It'll bring up a text box. You can type in it, hit save, and it will go on the page. And then you can drag it wherever you want it. So um, I am going to randomly assign you to breakout rooms this time. Um, and 
let's do let's do some smaller breakout rooms. How many people are in here right now? Like 20 something. Okay. We're going to do five breakout rooms. Um, I will give everyone a few minutes. If you have questions, feel free to uh, put them in the chat. Um, I will also try to hop between breakout rooms and yeah, just try to brainstorm some potential data points. Okay. Are we all adding sticky notes to the same uh, board that you just showed? So there'll be lots yeah. and lots of sticky notes on them. Okay. Yes, there'll be lots of sticky notes. Great, and uh, Meredith, if you could pause the recording uh, for the breakout room so we don't have a huge quiet session. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. So it looks like we had a lot of great conversation and seeing a ton of great sticky notes here. Um, I just wanna run through some of them quickly. We've got a lot of different roles in the room from a program manager, coordinator, epidemiologist, data analyst, home visitor. And it looks like we need to know a lot of different things, zip code, name, needs, age, demographics, client experiences, family concerns, for a lot of different reasons. I'm seeing eligibility, referrals, supporting participant needs, seeing if clients are eligible for other programs, reporting to funders, these are great. And I also want to say that this format can be a really great way to brainstorm um, other types of forms and surveys too. It doesn't just have to be for intakes. Some of this stuff you might need to know like later on in someone's time in a program. For example, reflections on someone's experience in the program. Maybe that's something that you capture at every exit or like, you know, at the end of the enrollment period or however your program is structured. So, you know, this information can you know, go somewhere, even if it's not in the intake. So um, I also wanted to show some other example data points. Um, it looks like most of these were covered in uh, the brainstorming, but, you know, we've got demographic data and client information. Um, so I'm hoping for our next exercise, I just wanted to briefly come back together we're gonna go back into the same breakout rooms and I want to do some why, when, and how practice. So um, as a group or on your own within the group brainstorming, choose one of the data points that you need to know, something in this area of the screen, and then think about why do you need to know it, which you already brainstormed in the last one. This last thing is the why. Um, so why do you need to know it? When do you need to know it? And then what are some ways that you could gather it? You don't have to have the how perfectly figured out. You do not have to have like a perfect question in mind, but especially if um, the data point is something more broad, like experiences with services or families needs, think about how you might make that a little more concrete and specific, because um, that's a really big topic. So going back to my earlier example, Initially, I had said the data point that I might need to know is the family's needs so that I could provide them with appropriate referrals. I think I would probably need to know that within the first few visits so that I could make sure to start connecting them to services. How maybe I decide that I want a specific needs assessment administered in the second visit, or maybe it's a single question that happens in the first visit, you know, that's like a checkbox. There's a lot of different ways to collect this, there is no one right answer. So just to recap, I'm gonna put us back into the same rooms and we're gonna have some time to brainstorm, um, taking one of the data points we thought of earlier or a new one, bringing in the why, and then thinking about the when and the how. Okay, any questions? Great, I am going to us all back into the rooms.
Welcome back, everyone. It looks like there was some great conversation. I'm seeing a lot of potential data points up here, a lot of different whys, some whens and hows. Um, and uh, I also wanted to share two things that um, I heard in breakout rooms that I thought were really useful. Um, Veronica and Kimberly brought up um, that uh, it can be difficult sort of to um, gain trust if you don't have information. Um, and uh, made me think of how sometimes you just have to ask questions multiple times, um, both because um, you might gain trust over time. And so people might feel comfortable sharing more, but also because the answer might change. Um, so it's always worth revisiting questions where the answer might change um, and thinking about um, frequency of how often you ask something can be part of the when. Um, and I also wanted to say that there can be multiple whys too. Um, you know, you might want to know a family's needs so that you can connect them with different services and give them the best referrals, but you might also want to know a family's needs so that you can zoom out and see all of the needs of all of the families that you're serving and where there are gaps so that you can apply for funding to fill those gaps or create a partnership with an organization that can help support your participants in that particular way. So there can be multiple whys. Does anyone else have anything that they want to share from the breakout rooms? In our room, we were talking about um, gathering ethnicity uh, with the purpose of matching the client to the right community, but that can be complicated because um, people's ethnicity is very multidimensional. Yeah, absolutely. We talked about that similarly about you do need to know that information up front so you can make the match with the case manager or a home visitor. So maybe that touches on the how you ask. So maybe that's a conversation instead of it being, you know, just something you fill out on a form that gets sent to you. Or, you know, just maybe how giving the opportunity to build in trust or rapport in a way if you are going to ask questions that, uh, you know have some nuance or may not be comfortable right out of the gate. And part of that can be, you know, making it clear that you take feedback and also being really intentional about that feedback. You don't want to just ask for feedback sort of willy nilly and then not do anything with it. That, that breaks trust. You know, if someone gives you feedback um, on a form or a process, it's really important to, follow through that maybe you can't change whatever they're giving you feedback on. Maybe you don't have power to, maybe you you know don't want to because it works for the majority of participants, whatever, but you should definitely follow through and follow up because um, you know giving feedback can be vulnerable. So if someone shares with you that um, something, a question graded on them or they didn't feel comfortable answering something, you should respect that. And that is an opportunity to build trust. And also intentionally asking for feedback in the form of like a focus group or an advisory council um, is a great way to just like regularly review all of your forms and processes. Building on something you said earlier, um, in, in one of the breakout groups we talked about actually putting on the form or saying out loud, you can change any of the information you give me. If you have an update, you know, you can let me know and you can change that at any time. So if someone isn't yet feeling comfortable giving you information, for example, about a trans identity, maybe they can come back later and they just know right out of the gate that it's it's going to be okay to come back later and change that information once trust has been built. Yeah, absolutely. And that makes me think of something I see Amy put in the chat, um, amending data to reflect an evolving sense of self. And so, you know, if you are working with a population that might like want to change some of their answers to things at certain points, maybe you intentionally re-ask those things at different times or, or otherwise normalize, you know, coming back to someone and being like, hey, actually, you know, I want to use this name or whatever it is. I want to wrap up with a few final thoughts and then bring us back to um, broader questions. Um, so, oh, <laughs> I 
um, you know, this was just skating the surface of forms and intake forms. There's so much more that I could say about this topic and I am not like an expert, um, really the experts in your forms are your participants, the communities that you're serving and the people who are administering the forms. So you should certainly ask them for their opinions. But um, it's important to know that data is a powerful tool. You know, it can be used for good. It can definitely cause harm. Um, and so it's worth being intentional uh, about it and thinking critically about um, how your organization is using data and collecting data. Community members are the owners of their data. Um, they should, you know, have informed consent when they're sharing it with you. They should be able to revoke that consent at any time. Um, they should be able to have data shared back with them, you know, impacts of your program. We don't want to just be sharing data up to boards and to funders. We want to be sharing it back with the people who are accessing our services because they're invested too. Um, and remember, ask yourself, is this something that I feel comfortable reading aloud or sharing back to my client? And is this something that I'd feel comfortable filling out for myself? I'm not going to say that that one, I don't think that the golden rule is a good rule because everyone has different comfort levels and you might think that a question is totally fine and it might not be okay for someone else. But it's generally a pretty good initial benchmark to think like, if I'm struggling with this question, like undoubtedly someone who has filled out this form on the front end probably also struggling with this question. So those are just a few final thoughts. And now I wanna leave space for any other questions, ideas, thoughts. Feel free to speak up or put things in the chat. So Meredith just put in the chat that um, all of the example forms that we shared at the beginning are um, annotated on the website. Um, we also have uh, that like Jamboard exercise that you did. We have that as a um, fillable PDF handout in case you ever want to go through that process. Um, and uh, we have a few other free resources on our website. So feel free to visit that. Um, I do wanna make a quick um, plug for our evaluation form. Um, if you have like two minutes and want to give us any feedback, we would love to hear it. Um, I hope that this training was helpful to you. Um, you can also contact Meredith or myself if you're interested in uh, having a training for your organization. Um, and all of our resources are at our website. Um, so I'm just going to leave this up right now and you know, if you have questions, feel free to stick around and ask them. I will stay on for a few minutes after 1 p.m. I'm happy to answer any questions. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>